Welcome to the Derek Loudermilk Show. This is episode 369 with Foster Gamble. Foster Gamble is probably best known for being one of the creators of the documentaries Thrive and Thrive 2, which are the most widely viewed in history. They have over 94 million documented views. Thrive came out 10 years ago and Thrive 2 came out last year. And there was a moment when I was watching the Thrive 2 documentary where they validate a working free energy device, this inventor in Africa. And I stood up and I ran around my house screaming, this is going to change everything. This is incredible. And I got goosebumps and it was the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And it turns out Foster has been working in studying free energy and encountering inventors around the world for decades. He's met at least 30 successful free energy inventors and a lot more that uh, didn't really pan out. So one thing that happened after Foster Gamble made these documentaries was that the whole world now knew who he was and they started reaching out. Hey, I have these solutions. And he started getting connected with people all over the world who already have the solutions that we need as humanity to thrive. And his mission is to help bring people that are working on projects, solutions together, sharing ideas. He's got something called the Solutions Hub, which allows you to find the types of projects that you're interested in contributing to or, or learning from. And he's also well studied, and they present this in their documentaries. He's also well studied on what we're up against in terms of the, the dark forces and the, the ways that different institutions and organizations in human society have essentially been captured and are, are twisted in a, in a way that makes them not fit for their intended purpose such as, you know, the banking system, the political system, the education system, things like that. And even though he has seen the dark side of so many things, he's incredibly optimistic because he's also met hundreds and thousands of people around the world who are making an incredible difference. And Foster, like me, I see us as aggregators of what's working and, you know, really highlighting these bright spots in humanity. So this is this is such a fantastic conversation because not only has he is he full of information but he's also traveled all over the world experiencing things that you wouldn't even think a human would be able to experience and he's going to talk about some of those perhaps for the first time ever here on this podcast so without further ado here is foster gamble foster gamble welcome to the show Thank you, Derek. It's great to be on with you. Yeah, and I'd just like to start by uh, having you tell us you know, how, how you got into to what you're doing. How did you get involved in all this? Well, that's what I made my first film about, Thrive, Thrive One. I actually recreated the situation from when I was 14 years old. And, uh, you know, that was like just before and during the whole Bay of Pigs thing and so forth. And, you know, there was considerable concern about nuclear war. So I was, uh, you know, in sixth grade and we did this drill where they set off an air raid siren outside. And then the teacher said, you know, uh, there's a uh, nuclear missile coming. Everybody duck under your desk and put your arms over your head. And so I did that and I'm looking around and this, the sirens going around. <laughs> I'm looking around going, oh my God, if this is what the adults think is going to save me from a nuclear weapon, we're in trouble. I, I got to help <laughs> figure out how human beings can relate to energy effectively. And th literally, I, I spent the rest of my life doing exactly that. Wow. That's, I mean, thank you for sharing. And what a, I can imagine you hiding under a desk from a bomb. Uh, <laughs> And and that's what actually caught my attention. I saw Thrive Two, and I was most excited about the um, the African inventor. You went there and you validated his free energy device, and I thought, oh my god, this is going to change everything. And yeah. um, so so 
first, I would just wanted to ask you about, yeah, your journey of looking into energy and um, is that, so first of all, is that guy still alive? He is. He's been pretty sick, but he's still alive. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, and, and then sort of big picture, free energy. Is it, is it coming soon? Well, I think it's already here, but in terms of coming out to the public, um, I, I think that it's getting imminent. The, I think that the challenges uh, are no longer uh, really technical. They're more financial, getting these people the support they need, uh, and political, getting these people the, the security and the strategies that they need to get these things safely out, to get, to get the toothpaste out of the tube, because there are huge vested interests with governments, militaries, intelligence agencies, you know, uh, international energy corporations and so forth, all of whom don't want to see this come out. <laughs> so that, that, that's pretty formidable to go up against. So I encourage my inventors to come as close as they can to the strategy of if you've really got it, then put it on the internet so that before anybody knows what's happened, there's a thousand labs are already trying to recreate it all over the world. And oftentimes they think, well, you know, people put all this money into my invention and I got to pay them back. And I, I say, yeah, but you're not going to be able to pay them back if you're dead. And if the thing never comes out, <clears throat> then you're not going to be able to, to pay them back. So there will be plenty of market for your product, even if you've let it go free, you know, sell the, the next edition, sell your consulting services. You'll instantaneously be the most famous scientist in history yeah, if you do this thing. So get out of the, the traditional mode, go the route that's safe, because as soon as that knowledge is outside of you, there's no point in killing you anymore. It just brings attention uh, to the knowledge. So, you know, we're close with that on a couple of the, the inventors, but, you know, there's different strategies that are, that are appropriate for different situations. I, I imagine they would perhaps have like sent it to a bunch of people to be released on the, in the event of their deaths or something like that. Yes, um, exactly. I, I don't work officially with any inventors uh, who haven't secured their intellectual property in multiple locations uh, in multiple countries. And so you said something like my, my inventors, I tell them this, what, what does that mean exactly? Like how, what capacity is your relationship with them? Well, I've been um, investigating uh, free energy for about 25 years. Um, and the vast majority, like over 95% of the things that I've checked out, and, and there have been probably in the realm of 600 different uh, free energy inventors have approached me. Um, and, you know, less than 5% turn out to be the real thing. Even if they're well-intended and honest, they turns out they don't know how to measure what they've got. Uh, or in some cases, they're just out and out scams. You know, they've got hidden energy sources and they're just trying to get your money up front and that type of thing. But I, I would say to your audience, if this is something that sounds really crazy to you, you know, ask yourself, um, if extraterrestrials are visiting this planet, and there's a ton of evidence now, even, you know, the government and CNN are admitting and they're showing the videos and so forth. If that's true, what are the chances that they're actually like burning Exxon on the way, you know, carrying their fuel? If they're coming to like light years distance, you know, much less, just, I mean, even from another solar system. Uh, so there must be some energy source that they're tapping all along the way which indicates that there's probably energy everywhere. Well, physics has come to the place now where all the top physicists in the world agree <clears throat> that uh, empty space is not empty. It's actually full of virtually infinite energy at every point. And so given that, the key is then, how do you access that energy harmoniously, you know, without fizzing it, fusing it, exploding it, combusting it? How do you <clears throat> actually just put your equipment into resonance with that energy so that you can tap it harmoniously wherever you are. Now, if nobody had done that yet, then why have we had, in, in Thrive 2, I scroll a, a, a very partial list 
of about 30 free energy inventors who have either been uh, killed, disappeared, gag ordered, <clears throat> or you know bought out. And then the company that buys them out just puts it on the shelf and, and hides it. So why would all of that be happening if they were all frauds? And in my research, the government has had this for quite a while. I've talked to uh, whistleblowers from the military who have actually seen them, they've worked on them and so forth. And, they, uh, and they've told me, some of them have, have even said it publicly, that they already have free energy and anti-gravity. And that's one of the reasons why they don't want anyone else to have it so that they can uh, keep the advantage for military reasons. So if all of that leads to showing pretty compelling evidence that the phenomenon of accessing energy from the plenum, from the space around us, is real, then it all makes sense all of a sudden. It makes sense that the ETs are getting here. It makes sense that people are being suppressed. It makes sense that the government has, has confiscated over 11,000 new energy patents. Uh, why would they be doing that if it's just a bunch of kooks? 11,000 patents. Yeah. Wow. And it's the government can confiscate a patent? Yeah. The U.S. Patent Office reserves the right to not only confiscate your patent, but then issue a gag order, which says that you're, no, you're not allowed to speak about it, you're not allowed to continue to work on it, and you need to give them, give them the list of anybody uh, who knows about what you're doing. And this is an official national security document. Oh, good grief. So that's why I also recommend to all of, quote, my inventors, and by my inventors, I just mean the ones that I've chosen to work with in some official capacity, whether that's financial, business, security, uh, whatever. <clears throat> and I advise them all to, if you, if you have the real deal, don't apply for a patent because that's how you give your secret sauce away and how you entitle them to stop your mission. Wow. Um, so of these uh, 5% or so that have working models, uh, how are they similar and how are they different? Yeah, are there yeah. different ways of accessing Yeah, it's this? a really important question. Yeah, the, the, what's, what is similar, I said it in Thrive One, but you know, you know, hundreds of inventors later, it's still true when, when we came out with Thrive Two, um, that every single device that I have seen that is working is somehow toroidal in nature. And for mm -hmm. any of your viewers who haven't, seen Thrive 1 or Thrive 2, the Taurus, T-O-R-U-S, it's not an astrological symbol. The, the Taurus is a donut-shaped whirlpool of energy. It's the shape of the electromagnetic field around an atom, around a, a human body, around a planet, around a solar system, around a galaxy, around a cluster of galaxies, then it goes down uh, subatomic as well. So it turns out that it's the fundamental energy pattern of sustainable systems everywhere in the cosmos, as far as we can tell. So that's huge. You know, at a point when civilization is trying to figure out how to have our systems be sustainable, the fact that we're finally discovering the cosmic blueprint for sustainability is a good thing. You know, that, that's a real breakthrough. And each of these devices, I mean, most people have seen just a copper coil and a motor or something like that. That copper coil generates a magnetic field of a particular shape that then they can use in the motor. And that shape is the key. All of the different technologies, whether they're working on radio frequencies or on uh, magnetics or on electron rotations in coils, there's lots of different approaches. But the, all the successful ones I've seen are mimicking and going into resonance this is like playing in a band, you know, when you tune your guitars, once you, once you get them all in, this, in the same key, then there's a resonance that happens that everybody can feel because it's, it's harmonious. It's exactly the same with the energy devices. The biggest challenge, once you've figured out how to tap it, is to keep your device tuned to that resonance. Hmm. Uh, they get out tuned to the toroid shape. is, is um comes out of uh, form or something? Not necessarily the shape, but it's usually the frequency. You, 
Um, what I say is, is what I've seen is you need to have the right materials for your device. You need to have the right shape for your device. And then you need to have the right frequency, usually either a frequency of rotation or literally uh, electronic frequencies that are making your device uh, vibrate. And when you get all of that right, then you, your, your device, I mean, the first time I saw it, I, I, both my wife and I just wept, you know, to stand in the presence of a device that's not plugged in and it's just pulling energy, clean, safe energy, pulling it out. It, it, it's really moving because not only does it, sh does it foretell an economic paradigm shift when everybody has access eventually to local cheap or, or free energy, then that's a whole different thing for civilization. But also what it does, ex what experiencing that does is make real the notion that we actually live in a universe of infinite abundance and it proves it. As you were, as you were talking about keeping the, keeping these devices in, in tune, um, someone just started tuning an instrument just on the other side of my house. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's so funny. Well, so. I, guess, I guess we're in the flow here. <laughs> how much of these, how many of these devices do you think are reverse engineered ET craft uh, technology? I think the ones that the government has, there's a, 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 a lot of them. I think that's how they, they got it. Uh, also, they stole a ton of information um, from uh, Nikola Tesla when he died. He had like 84 trunks full of, of uh, you know, his research, and over half of those were taken by the government and never returned. Um, when they confiscate these, these patent applications, uh, they give them to their black ops projects and say, you know, try these ones, see, you know, see if they work. And, um, and this is happening all over the world. There are, are governments, you know, and other labs that are that are all working on this. And it's really exciting to see how many creative approaches there are. It's like you think how many different types of music there are, how many different styles of dancing there are, but fundamentally they're all, you know, establishing a rhythm and then a melody and then writing on that. And that's the same thing these energy devices are doing. Hmm. <clears throat> are you familiar with, um, and I've only just encountered this, how the pyramids, uh, produce energy, which is a little bit different. Well, I'm certainly familiar with the stories and the phenomenon. I, I've been obsessed with the pyramids since I was a young child. Um, and so I've studied them for many, many years. And there's a lot of things about the pyramid, particularly, let's take the example of the Giza pyramid. Um, the shape of the Giza pyramid fits perfectly into the geometry of space that we unpack in the unified field theory that was revealed in Thrive 2. So that, uh, that semi, uh, you know, it's a half octahedral pyramid. It's four, mm -hmm. four uh, sides, you know, a base, and then it goes up to a point. And the angles of all that fit in with the geometry of the unified field. Then you go into the king's chamber um, and the dimensions of the room and the dimensions of the sarcophagus, which is this, uh, this stone uh, open vault in the, in the middle of the, not in the middle of the room, but in the right place in the room, um, is all phi ratios. So it's the, it fits the natural spiral ratios that mm -hmm. all of life uses, that a, you know, a spiral shell, a, a plant, the spiral on your fingertip and the back of your, your hair and so forth. It's, there's a certain... Uh, ratio of growth that allows a an organic being to keep their proportions while increasing their scale. So a plant grows, a tree grows, a you know a shell grows, and so the the Great Pyramid's built on all those same numbers. So it's even though it's uh, made of stone, it's a very organic thing. And then when you really come down to the essence of it. Um, not to be long-winded, but this is this is really important. The um, the most sort of honored, revered artifact in religious history was the Ark of the Covenant by Christianity, 
uh, Judaism and Islam. The major artifact was this Ark of the Covenant. And there's uh, many, many uh, drawings, etchings of it and so forth. And several have been found. Um, they, they're still secret, but they, and I can't talk a lot about it, but several uh, you know, defunct ones have been found. But the key to the Ark of the Covenant you know, the, the story in the Christian Bible was that it was, you know, this box where they put the tablets that Moses brought down off the mountain. Well, I think it was a lot more than a storage cabinet for some clay tablets that probably never existed. What I, what I and my colleagues all think that it was, was a capacitor box. And they, it's described very carefully in the Bible that the, ratio, the ratios, and again, it's phi ratios, the uh it's gold on the outside and then acacia wood in the middle which is a good conductor and then gold on the inside that's that creates a capacitor something that will store energy inside then they close it and they've got two gold cherubim on the top mm -hmm. and the arc of the covenant is the arc of electricity that was going between those two gold cherubim which are basically the electrodes Hmm. Where you can where you can discharge excess energy from the capacitor and where you can access that energy for other things that you were doing. Well, it turns out that the Ark of the Covenant is an exact fit to sit inside the sarcophagus in hmm. the king's chamber in the you know the, the greatest building ever built. And that's not that's not random. I think that's where they were accessing the energy that then vibrated the entire pyramid. Um, so I, and then, that, then they do all sorts of stuff with that, but that's, that's another story. <laughs> so, the, so your understanding is the arc is like a, like a portable battery in a sense. Yeah. It's a free energy device. Yeah. Ah, cool. And why can't you talk about what, what do you know where they are or. Well, th there were a couple of, um, of secret archeological expeditions that I'm privy to that have not been revealed to the public yet. And they are, let's just say exciting beyond imagination uh, and but they're very dangerous at this point uh there people have died already related to them uh, trying to bring out some of the knowledge so uh, i'm not the one to bring it out i'll spread it when it comes out but it's up to someone else when they will reveal this i want to i want to ask you about uh about how you get access to all these you know secret things but um I'd love to share what I what uh, I've just learned about the the way the pyramids do uh, establish the energy, and this is from <clears throat> a couple different channeled sources. Of um, so I follow a person who does galactic history, um, different civilizations and different parts of the the galaxy, and um, this this person was channeling uh, the race that's built the pyramids. <clears throat> or advised the humans um, in the building of the pyramids, and she was describing how they work. And um, it's essentially uh, taking, it's like lightning, um, has the charge of the atmosphere and the charge of the ground. Um, so there's a positive charge on the ground, I believe, and a negative charge. In, and so it's um, the pyramid itself is condensing the charge from the atmosphere and then collecting it in those chambers. And then it's grounded into the... Um, into the aquifer under underneath and yes. the, the key parts that are missing are the the insulators the 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 white blocks that are no longer there that were on the sides that's right yeah um and then the the capstone which was also a um, gold plated quartz um right. which allowed yeah the energy to be sort of collected in those in those chambers yeah i i think that that's accurate also uh and the and then there's another theory um, that there's a phenomenon called tachyons. And tachyons are supposedly faster than light particles, which actually are circulating around the earth uh, from east to west all the time. And uh, the, some people, some researchers that I know have done laser studies for years where they, they built miniature versions in plexiglass of the pyramid with the king's chamber in it and so forth. And then they would use light beams to imitate tachyons. And when they got all the dimensions right, these tachyons, as they passed through the side of the pyramid, would be reflected by the inner stones, particularly the, the, uh, those kind of 
pyramidal shape, the umbrella shaped stones that are over the top of the king's chamber, they would be reflected four different times. This is tachyon flow and then be focused directly into the sarcophagus in the center of, or, of the king's chamber. Ah. And they, so we're talking, we were talking about energy right now, but there's another whole dimension of it. I think particularly your audience would be interested in if they're not familiar already, which is that I strongly believe based on a ton of research that the king's chamber of the great pyramid was an initiation chamber. And this was maybe even the most important thing that it, it was. And they, the priests would get trained through seven stages of initiation. Um, and they would get trained in meditation, in uh, physical fitness, in nutrition, uh, all sorts of things. So they would advance their consciousness. And then when they were ready through their training in the priesthood for the seventh level, then they, were, they would uh, fast for several days, you know, just have juices, get anointed in particular ways, and then be laid down in that king's chamber, in the, the uh, sarcophagus. Um, which I had the opportunity to to lie in a couple of years ago. It's a, absolutely astounding. Oh wow! You lie in this this uh, granite block, um, and then the the whole pyramid would be resonated, and that resonance would focus your brain waves. The there's a thing called the Schumann resonance, which is the heartbeat of the Earth. It's a huge standing wave which circulates around the Earth all the time. And it's at about 7.83 cycles per second. Well, that's where our brain waves are when we're alert and yet at rest. That's the zero point of the brain waves. You go faster up into doing stuff. You go slower down into meditation, creativity, psychic phenomena, and so forth. But the threshold is at about 7.83. So I believe that the, amongst other things, that the, the King's Chamber was a, an energy focusing device for the brainwave vibration that would entrain the, uh, the student into uh, and then through that portal where they would basically go into an out of body experience for three days. And that's where they and in the lore about Egypt, that's when you would basically be introduced directly to God. <laughs> so, so you would be in these outer realms being taught by light beings who are non-physical. And then when you came back into your body in the king's chamber, that's when you began to actually function as a priest because you'd not only been trained, but now you had been initiated. Wow. Yeah, that I totally believe it. Um, yeah. Did you experience anything in lying in there? Uh, you, your sound cut out for a second. Did I what? Did you experience anything lying in the sarcophagus? I experienced a deep sense of peace and I experienced uh, a lot of resonance because I, um, I, I tried chanting different tones. I knew from other people that there were tones that would start resonating. And when I, and there were, there were three different tones that would resonate the entire block of stone. And that was an outstanding feeling. I was with a group of people in such a way that each of us only had about 20 minutes actually lying in the chamber, but I could, I could definitely feel that, uh, that if I were able to keep going, it would really uh, deepen my states a lot. That's pretty special to uh, to have that to to have twenty minutes there. I mean, wow. Well, it was a special. Do you know who Nassim Haramin is? I do. Yeah, I'm actually. I've got one of his uh, art art crystals on today. Oh, great! I was wearing one last night. Yeah. Well, there I, I went on the trip with him. He and I had always wanted to go. Neither of us had ever been in 2017. Um, his organization took a group and my wife and I went with them and they had set it up ahead of time so that we had uh, all three pyramids to ourselves for the entire night um, uh, on the full moon in October. Uh, as far as we know, no one had ever been granted that before, but they really respect his work over there. And so there were 170 of us and we, we, we were in all three pyramids simultaneously and we each had one of those uh arc crystals that uh that you have around your neck show that again to your audience because this Let's is see if i can uh take take it off here yeah for for those just listening holding up a crystal it's sort of a 
pyramidal shape. Um, yeah, it's it's a grown quartz that's harmonized with his device. I can't remember what his device is called. Yeah, the resonator. Um, and the uh, the it's not only a grown crystal to exactly the right angles and proportions, but it also is floating in little magnetic holders. So that it, yeah, there you go. And so when when that crystal is put into the holder, it floats magnetically so that it is free to resonate with the unified field. And so he had done a study in Tulum where he, he had 30 people and some rudimentary crystals. And they did this meditation on top of a pyramid and sent their intention through each of their crystals down into the center of the earth and basically just sent love out into the to the unified field. And then they started getting seismic reports the next day that there was this huge wave that had come out from exactly where they were, like they'd never seen before. They thought an earthquake was coming, but none ever did. And that's when Nassim goes, okay, I think we have the right geometry. You combine that with human consciousness and something else you know, starts to happen. So that was part of the reason why we went to Egypt, because we 170 of us all had these crystals. We all went into the into these the pyramids at the same time with tetrahedral arrays where you take those those crystals you just held up and you put them together and they'll stick magnetically to other ones. And you can create um, a, an eight tetrahedron crystal or a 64 or a 128. Those are the key uh, sort of uh, resonant notes in the octaves. And so we took those into the the key spot. You know, we had one of those in the in the sarcophagus. We had one on the the holy of holies in each one of them. We put mm. one of those crystals there. Then we did this meditation and chanting for you know for hours in there. And then the next day, over the next one or two days, we were traveling up the Nile to the Isis temple. And one of the guides, one of the Egyptian guides, gets a call from the Russian space agency <laughs> on his <laughs> on his cell phone. He's riding along and uh and this call comes in and they go, you know, he introduces himself and he says, I, you know, we, we know that you were, had a group in the in the pyramids uh, the other night. And we're just wondering, what were you doing in there? And, you know, you're not even allowed to sing or meditate or pray uh, in the in the uh, pyramids. But we actually had guards keeping other people out so we could do what we wanted. And so um the the guide was very cautious about this and he said well, well you know we were just doing a little chanting and so forth so well, why are you curious about this and they said because we've got geosynchronous satellites monitoring the entire surface of the earth 24 7 and we've never seen anything like what came off the giza plateau the night you were in there whoa and we were like whoa okay <laughs> And we hadn't seen any seismographic reports yet, but we were on the way up to the Isis temple where we had reserved the temple between midnight and 3 a.m. So we did the same thing again in the Isis temple. The next day, we checked the seismographic reports on the Internet for Asia and Africa. And, you know, there were a few little earthquakes here and there. And then there was this huge thing coming right out from the Nile, Whoa. right out of where we were at the Isis temple at 1.30 a.m. So that's three times in a row. That That is not coincidence. So the point of this is that I think Nassim's geometry, and he and I have been working together for over 20 years, but he's very good on the physics of this stuff. Um, we, we believe that we are accurate in terms of the geometry that resonates with the natural structure of the unified field of which we're all a part. Wow. Uh, what an amazing story. Oh my gosh. Um, I mean, anyone that's ever done, I don't tell a... that one all the time, but I've watched <laughs> a bunch of your videos and I noticed that you can go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Wow. Thank you for watching. Um, oh, it was a pleasure. <clears throat> uh, you know, anyone that's participated in a group meditation perhaps has felt, you know, the, the amplified power of, of the group and, um, you know, that having a device like a crystal in a special place. I mean, right. wow. Um, exactly. Yeah. How, okay. So how, how did you, how did they give you guys permission to be in the pyramids overnight? Like, you know, did you just say like, I'm special. Uh, we <laughs> want to do a thing. Like, you know, what, what paves the way for that to happen? No, it's, it's a combination of uh, 
finding the right guides to contact who are open-minded. And we had some people who had contacts who could find those people. And then familiarizing them, them if they weren't already with Nassim's work. And they were absolutely fascinated with what he had done. Uh, and then that in combination with a little bakshish, you know, a, a little uh, tip, a little, some little bribes to, uh, to allow us to do that for a night. Uh, all that came together very auspiciously at the right time. I'm not, I'm not a personally a sophisticated br uh, briber. Um, <laughs> I've, I've probably 50, 50, 50 so far. Um, <laughs> but I know that you've done a ton of traveling, you know, so we've, I've interviewed um, like Jim Rogers and he, you know, drove around the world twice, you know, investing along the way. And he talked about the skill of, of bribing and also using, uh, this was back in the nineties. He was using Polaroids. He would give Polaroids of him, mm -hmm. like a selfie to the yeah. border guards and they would just let, let him through. Um <clears throat> We've also had the world's most traveled man on the show and he's, you know, he's gotten talked his way out of a lot of bribes, but I'd love to hear, you know, just because you've been around so many places <laughs> doing these investigations, like what's the, what's the sort of trickiest situation you've been in uh, on your, on your travels? Well, the trickiest one uh, I believe was the inventor that you mentioned before, the young African guy from Zimbabwe. Uh, Maxwell Chikumbutso. Um, when I went over to see him uh, the first day, I came in at night, and then the first, the next day, we we got together at a particular location at this church where he had the uh, uh, a large version of his device uh, out in the parking lot. Um, and so he started giving me a tour, and my you know, the people I was traveling with, I was traveling with um, a, a security guard and a film crew, um, and. So he starts giving us this uh, tour and um, all of a sudden people start showing up, locals start showing up in suits, looking very dour and suspicious. And so Maxwell comes over to me and, and he says, uh, I didn't know they were coming, but those are representatives from the government and I can't tell them to go away. So they were hovering around this whole thing. And at one point they took him aside uh, and you were, I don't know, I didn't know what they were going to be saying to him, whether they were threatening him or, or telling them to get rid of me or, or what. But fortunately, Maxwell, we had wired him, we had a, a lapel mic on, <laughs> and, he, and it was still turned on when they took him, you know, kind of behind this shed, to, I think, give him a talking to. So, um, so when he came back, uh, I mean, we, we quickly got the film and sent the audio track back to California to to our technicians who got a local translator who who spoke the language from uh zimbabwe and they translated it and sent it back to us so we oh, could wow. tell what they were saying and they what they were saying actually was they were afraid that maxwell was going to do deals with me and not with them because they had already tried to get his technology but they tried to take it and he and they actually put him in jail uh for 52 days and tortured him and tried to get him to give it to him. And he, he said, listen, you know, this is my, this knowledge is my gift from God to share with all, all people on the planet. And he said, so if I give it to you, you hoard it for your military, nobody else gets it. And my, my mission is then impossible. So, um, so I think when they saw that I was there with an entourage and I was very serious about, and with a film crew and all there was, now they were getting the attention outside the country then I think they decided to to treat him a little better. And so it turns out what the guy was doing was offering him a deal <laughs> uh, behind the shed saying, OK, well, we'll sign these particular power purchase agreements. And we'll let you also take it out. But we definitely want to start with it here in Zimbabwe. And he said, great, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. And so they actually let us film and they you know, let me stay there. They, I did get a call the next morning uh, from the office of the president of Zimbabwe uh, saying that, you know, he wanted to see me at three o'clock that afternoon. It's like, okay, that's probably not good. <laughs> you know, and Zimbabwe is a rough place. You know, they, yeah, <clears throat> you, you got to be on your toes over there. And so, so I sat down with my security guard and we came up with a strategy because he didn't, he said, first of all, you're not going in there without me. And secondly, I'm, I don't think both of us should go in there. And so 
so I sent a note back to the president and I, I said, you know, we are deeply honored by your invitation and my security team and I would love to come to your meeting this afternoon with our film crew because we'd like to record this auspicious conversation. Mm. So all of a sudden now he was going to be on record and with security guards. So he canceled the meeting <laughs> and then and we didn't have any trouble after that. Wow. <laughs> What uh, what a hoot! That's amazing. Um, and so you said this this fella. Sorry, what's his name again? The inventor is Maxwell. Maxwell, the and inventor. Yeah, is so. You said he was sick. Was he? What what happened to him? Well, he was um, before I ever met him, and we we depict this in Thrive too. He and his partner, uh, after he had been put in jail and so forth, uh, and then they finally let him out when they realized they weren't going to get it. Um, get the knowledge to themselves they let him out but both he and his business partner uh, who was a wealthy guy from South Africa who had been funding a lot of his research I'm not South Africa South America um, Mm -hmm. both of them got poisoned at the same time and his partner didn't survive and he survived but his kidneys are a wreck Um, so he has been sick the entire time I've known him he just had a kidney replaced a couple of months ago uh, and I think he's feeling a little better now, but um, he's he's dealt with a lot of things. Mm. I'm just uh, I'm just feeling all these all these inventors who have been killed or poisoned or injured for trying to bring this. Like I'm, I'm feeling some some gratitude and some sadness uh, yeah. for for all of that. Thank you for letting that in. It, it's so poignant when you do. And if you don't, if you just hear the, 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 some of the facts or stories, you know, it just sounds like a bad James Bond movie or something like that. But it's very, very real, it's especially real in the, in the lives of these inventors and their families who, you know, who are being abused in this way. But it's also real for all of humanity. When we are fighting wars where m- millions of people die, supposedly over you know making the world safe for democracy but what's actually happening is the theft of oil the theft of gold and the installation of a Rothschild central banking system when if we can take away at least the excuse of energy give people access to energy then at least we're not going to be fighting over fossil fuels which are polluting the planet anyway and it's just one major step in liberation. And the second aspect of that is that the, the people who are trying to control all of humanity right now, one of the means of control is energy. That's why they want this smart grid. And that's why they want to, everybody's appliances all to be monitored and your, your uh, smart meter on your house so that the, the people who want to control everyone else can literally monitor what everybody's doing with their energy and then turn on or off whether or not you have energy and how much you have based on your obedience to their system. And that's one of the major control mechanisms along with now they want to do, you know, the federal reserve is bad enough, but now they want to do a central bank digital currency where they control all of money as well. They've already essentially taken over media. They've taken over education so the goal, their goal, their nefarious intent is to literally have a few people controlling all of us through controlling the means of production and distribution of everything. Yeah, I, I felt that, you know, energy was perhaps, I mean, I guess there's all these different control points, but I thought, gosh, that would just free everyone up so much. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just imagining like uh, a device in your house and a device in your car that's just giving you everything you need. Um, and economically, it would free people up to, you know, have a lot more income to, to use towards, you know, important things. Um, yes. <clears throat> let's, I, I'd love to sort of get your take sort of big picture on, on these, on the people, the very small percentage of people that are have this sort of globalist control agenda and you know this agenda you know let's say it's been in play for hundreds or thousands of years so people come and people go yet the sort of the vibe of it continues on and so how how do you think um 
that people become part of this control program? Mm. Well, I've, fortunately, I've done a lot of research on that, and it's chilling. Um, a lot of them grow up in families that have been in it from, from multiple generations, and they get indoctrinated into the worldview that, you know, son, there's two types of people in the world. There's those that are controlled, and there's those that control them. Which do you want to be? You know, and if you give the wrong answer, you get beaten uh, or ignored. and, and um, and so you, you see a lot of the characters who show up as the Kissingers and Cheneys and, you know, Bush Sr. and Brzezinski's and Soros and these, and these guys, you look into their backgrounds and it's so similar most of the time that they were uh, ha had virtually no choice from a very early age to go along with the program and give up their own path give up their own scruples and morals in order to uh, be accepted into the League of Global Controllers. <clears throat> so that's one way. Another way is that uh, if someone's showing a lot of promise, I have numerous friends who were like famous scientists already in their early teens, and they, they, the, the CIA scours the country for these people and then they get approached you know you win a science fair in a big city or something like that and they're all over it and pretty soon they're you know they they just happen to run into you somewhere and pretty soon they're offering your parents a really sweet deal to have you come and work for them and i've had friends who've accepted those i've had friends who who turned it down and then uh suffered consequences uh so that's how they, they'll you know recruit scientists uh that as early as they can, but also out of the major universities and so forth. And then it's the same thing with politicians. They'll look for people who are uh, very bright um, and very charismatic, but also who have enough personality flaws that they can be manipulated. And then they'll groom uh, people like that for, and they'll groom, you know, thousands of them. And then, you know, Obama was one of these. And, you know, he's the one who made it to the top. But I'm sure he was one of hundreds of his age group who were being groomed. Now, nowadays, um, you, it's starting to come out with the World Economic Forum. Most people now have seen these videos where Klaus Schwab is bragging about his Young Global Leaders Academy, their camp, the, this uh, thing where they, where they recruit the best and the brightest from all over the world and then get them to commit to come to five years of summer camp, basically. And, you know, the, the Macrons and, and the uh, Merkels and the Gateses, and it, the, the list just goes on and on of the, the so-called leaders. They're all in league together, and they were all indoctrinated through the World Economic Forum, then to go out and take, you know, Justin Trudeau is another one, uh, the, the head of New Zealand, the head of Australia. They're all part of this, and you don't make it to the top. It's very unusual to make it to the top of that without already having been vetted and trained and uh, coerced. They have what they call collateral. They've got to get stuff on you in order to be able to control you. So they, they you know, have initiations where you have to share your deepest sexual secrets or they get you to participate either willingly or they drug you and then take films of, of you with a uh, you know, having sex with young kids or just being naked in the room with young kids or something like that. And th then they own you from then on. And so people who get recruited later on sometimes fall prey to that. A lot of young, hopeful politicians arrive in Washington. A guy just came out, a young congressman came out a couple of days ago um, and uh, is on YouTube now where, where he's acknowledging that a bunch of the older senators and Congress people kept approaching him, inviting them to these, him to these secret sex parties. It's exactly the way it happens. I've, I've talked to several people who were, you know, who got either caught up in this or they tried to and they got away. But it's a very, very real thing. And it's a global network of pedophiles that are paid well this is what jeffrey epstein was doing yeah, that's what they, I was thinking they, of. yeah they get paid well to get blackmail material on rising prominent people and then that's how they own them hey friends i want to take a quick second to tell you about a free 
no cost business training that I'll be hosting in April. This is a three day event, April 19th, 20 and 21st. And I call it the quantum entrepreneurship series. And this is a high level business training for coaches, healers, and spiritual entrepreneurs. And on the first day, you're going to learn the best types of businesses. Let's call them soul aligned business models that you can use to fuel your mission, to create freedom in your life, to live from anywhere. I've been testing this myself for almost nine years now, and I've interviewed uh, thousands of people. And so we're going to be distilling all that information to show you the different ways that you can earn uh, a living and be highly abundant as a spiritual entrepreneur. Day two, we're going to talk about the best metaphysical practices. My favorite, you know, I've done more than 50 metaphysical experiments in the last five years, and I've distilled those down into the, the ones that are most applicable for running a business. And finally, the last day is about infinite opportunity, how to build a world-class network and understanding the different levels of abundance so you can bring those into your business and your life. So again, this is a no-cost series. You can sign up for it now. We'll have links below this episode wherever you're listening or watching on YouTube. And you can also go to DerekLouderMilk.com and sign up for free there, and it will send you uh, emails to remind you exactly when that is, but they'll be at 12 central on those dates, the 19th, 20 and 21st. Thanks so much. Hope to see you there. Have you ever heard or, or seen a case of someone, um, who has been indoctrinated, who decides to, to get out and has done that successfully? Yes, absolutely. It's very dangerous. Um, but it's, I don't think it's more dangerous than staying in, in terms of the well being of your soul. Um, I did an interview with Kathy O'Brien recently. You know who she is? I'm not familiar. She's, uh, she's the most famous of uh, MK Ultra survivor. Mm. And people, uh, she's written a book called Trance, T-R-A-N-C-E, Transformation of America, where she, she basically, it's a transcript of her congressional testimony because she was, uh, she was sold into this uh, league as um, when she was about, I think it was maybe five or six years old, she, her, her family was a multi-generational pedophile family. And uh, her father got caught <clears throat> selling pornog child porn on the internet. And so the, the bad guys offered him a deal. And they said, you know, we won't prosecute you if you sell us your daughter, mm. which he did. And so she then went through the, the worst imaginable treatment that you could come up with for a human being. And she was what's called an MK Ultra White House level sex slave for until she was 30 and 29, actually. <clears throat> and so she came out finally and told this whole story. But most people don't survive it because when you're they, they torture you to split your personality, then they train different aspects of your personality, your multiple personality to be an assassin, uh, to be a courier, or to be a sex slave. Now, I'm just thinking, if, if, if your show goes on YouTube or Facebook, I probably just got you kicked off. <laughs> and well, you're we, welcome. We can choose which, uh, which segments we put on, okay, on the YouTube. Okay, that, yeah. that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect. Because it's vital that people are aware of this, but I don't want to undermine anybody's platform. Um, anyway, she... Uh, so she was a sex slave to a lot of famous people who she names in, in her book. She was a courier to people like Manuel Noriega because she had a, uh, she was trained into a photographic memory so they could send her with information without having to put it into a, a document. And she wasn't herself an assassin, but I, I, I know others who have been trained as assassins as well because they don't remember what they did. They, they get triggered into that personality and then they come back out of it and they don't even remember that they did this particular thing. There's that whole scene in uh, Zoolander where, where the supermodels are uh, MK ultra into being assassins. And they're like and, telling you, you know, it's a big comedy movie, but it's like, here's what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. And Jason Bourne was one of these, the, the whole Bourne identity, mm. Bourne supremacy and so forth. That story is about that. The Manchurian candidate was, was all about, it's a very real and very dangerous phenomenon. But anyway, when she, what happens is that particularly the women, when they approach age 30, they, they're in, their personalities start to reintegrate. 
So they start getting their memories back and that's very dangerous for the culprits. So they tend to kill them then. Uh, and she was literally to be taken to be killed. Um, and the guy who was driving her was a CIA guy who had fallen in love with her in some previous situations. And he knew uh, where he ha was taking her. So he prepared ahead of time and, and he got clothing and supplies and everything. And when he pulled away, it was just him and her in, in this uh, SUV. And he said, listen, this is what's going to happen to you. So I really care for you. And I, I'm willing to take a big risk to rescue you if you want to. And she goes, well, of course, and that seems like the better choice. Uh, so they literally split from Washington, D.C. and drove all the way to Alaska and holed up in a motel with guns there. And she, he, de he deprogrammed her for months, had to fend off several attacks because they ultimately found them. But he kept her alive. They ended up falling in love and getting married. It's a beautiful love story. Um, and her, her her memories all came out and she was willing to go public with it. And she has since become, and anybody who wants to see this, go, go to thriveon.com. I have a, a, a show called The Freedom Portal, and you can get a free one-week trial. Just sign up for free and then go to this episode uh, with Kathy O'Brien and watch it. It's, it's super touching because she from the worst torture imaginable, she is now one of the most radiant, loving, kind, and clear human beings that I've ever come across. So the point of this whole horror story is that, number one, it is going on and we need to stop it. And number two, that she is an example that it's not guaranteed, but it's possible for any human being to heal from anything. Mm. given the appropriate support and effort. Wow. And I, I'm, I'm stuck with this agent who had the skills and the, you know, the love to deprogram her to like, you know, m months of healing. And, um, you know, this is another, my, my friend, Nick, who I was telling you about, um, you know, he's talking about how we we're trying to do these global goals, but we're all dealing with trauma. Like we can't get ourselves out of bed to work on solutions because so many people are either programmed with trauma or that we just have trauma from living. And it's, and that's part of what's holding us back. And it does take a lot of dedicated healing work sometimes just to get to like neutral. Um, exactly. You know. and, then, and I really questioned Kathy about that because I said, you know, not many people, thank God, have to go through what you went through, but we've all got trauma. So, so tell us about the principles that you learned for healing. So she talks about it beautifully, but it turns out she also wrote a book uh, that called PTSD, A Time to Heal, where she lays out the principles that she learned and the practices that she employed to heal that really are we can all use. Um. Was was there uh, psychedelics involved in that process? You mean in her training? Uh, yeah, in that in the healing from PTSD. Not not in, not in her healing. Psychedelics hmm. were heavily involved in her torture and indoctrination. You know, oh, overdosing oh, on psychedelics. Yeah, hmm. like like so many things, they can be used for tremendous yeah. consciousness growth and healing, or if abused, you know, particularly uh, uh, yeah. overdosing a unprepared child or something like that uh they can be very destructive what what were some of those um healing principles or a couple of the important aspects yeah i won't say them as well as she did but there were things that, and they'll sound obvious but they, they're critical practices number one is be present stay in the present tense so stop complaining about the stuff from the past. Stop being afraid of stuff in the future and actually speak the truth of what you're knowing and feeling right now. And then secondly, know that your true nature is love. That you are a being of love and that you are lovable. No matter what anybody has done to you or convinced you to believe otherwise, that your true nature is love. And another one she talked about is that uh, love is the most powerful thing there is. And that in the same way that a single candle can uh, illuminate 
an entire dark room, a single being of love can heal and nurture a boundless number of souls. And that's what she's doing right now. I mean, it's such courage. Mm. Mm. Man, uh, this is this is a, an emotional. Uh, yeah, one of one of the me. things I got to tell you, Derek. <laughs> one of the things that I loved about watching your videos, and one of the reasons why I I wanted to and felt honored to come on, was that um, what we were just talking about. You are so present in the conversation that you actually think before you speak, and then you listen. And not only hear the words, but I, I could tell in your other videos that you're actually letting what the other person is saying sink in so that it becomes a part of your experience and then see what you want to ask or say next. And that now I was a communication trainer and facilitator in Silicon Valley for 20 years. So I really deeply studied the dynamics of communication. Hmm. And the most advanced skill of all is masterful listening. And you really do that well. Wow. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm part of a men's group, um, uh -huh. and the way that we have it set up is that one person is sharing and everyone else is listening and there's no responding really. Um, there's, uh, hand signals, which acknowledge certain things like that touched me, or I'm proud of you, or mm. I've been there. And <laughs> what that's sort of trained me to do is like, there's nothing else to do, but listen for most of the time until you're sharing um and so you're like well i might as well just like listen with everything i've got um and it's yeah. it's it's been good training for me i think <laughs> yeah this will be a whole different world when a critical mass of people are capable of doing that because it changes marriages it changes how children grow up it changes the the workplace the whole deal Now I'm kind of uh, now I'm kind of sidetracked about <laughs> where I was going to go next. Um, I guess uh, you know, knowing what you know, and and um, you you sort of have a picture of, of like what humanity is up against. Uh, there's multiple, you know, people can contribute or, or help humanity in so many different ways. But what do you see as some of the leverage points? Uh, you know, the best besides the energy, and we talked about some of these others, but like, what do you see as, as sort of bright spots where if we focus on them, they would sort of shift things the, the most quickly or, or most easily? Yeah, well, that that's my favorite thing to talk about. And it's really what uh, most of my life is focused on now. The Thrive One, the first movie was basically uh, the most accurate diagnosis we could make of what's in the way of humanity thriving and what can we do about it. Then Kimberly and my wife and I, she, she was the producer and director of the movies, uh, the, the already existing solutions in every sector that we saw in traveling around the world after Thrive One were so incredibly encouraging to us that we just did something we never thought we'd do again, which was just bite the bullet and make another feature film. And that's why we made Thrive Two because we needed to show that the solutions are already in existence on planet Earth. So then the next thing that I did was, well, once that was done, the movie was out, was uh, open up a channel just like you have here that, that I call the Freedom Portal, where people can become a part of the conversation. You know, if something's intrigued them, they're starting to get it. And, okay, I want to go deeper. I really want to understand this. So we go into in-depth conversations in every sector. And sometimes I bring, uh, you know, cutting edge thinkers in that sector on. And then, uh, you know, one time a month, we'll have like a, a community meeting where just, just a giant Zoom meeting where we can just all discuss with each other. And so, so we basically put those three things in place. And then I realized that you know, probably the last really major endeavor that I am have undertaken is to create uh, what we're calling the Thrive Solutions Hub. And it's a an open source, decentralized web app that the way we've designed it uh, is starting to allow ethical solutionaries in every sector of human endeavor to find each other either locally or virtually all over the planet and then to share best practices, 
to collaborate on projects, to, uh, to send messages out to a, what we call a network for networks. So instead of just sending something out to your network, you send it to what we call the coordinator's circle. And then all of them, you know, the, all the people who've come in and created a space have the choice of sending that message out to their network. So ultimately, you know, you can send a single message and have it go to, to you know, thousands of like-minded networks instantaneously. So we've been working on that for over a year. Um, had a whole team of developers working on it because it's, it's got to be user-friendly. It's got to be secure. It's private. Uh, certain functions are encrypted so that people can, can really feel secure on it and so forth. And um, we've been in beta testing for about six months now. And people are really loving it. We've got some very prominent individuals and very successful activist groups. I'm not gonna go into the names uh, right now for their own security. And we've got about 50 more who are about to come in in the next several weeks, uh, who've all said they want, want to do that. And um, so to me, uh, you know, with my dying breath, I, I wanna know that I've done everything that I could to help create the real, possibility for a thriving world for my children, for my grandchildren, for my species, you know, for my planet. Um, and so in my looking out there into the world and what's going on, I see, a, you know, a very dangerous situation that we're in that I've laid out in both movies, but also a very, very exciting, encouraging situation. It, it's it's actually the most exciting time in human history. There's never been a time when a single individual could make a bigger difference than right now, given the technologies we have, given the information that we have, the ability to get to the truth and then collaborate and then be effective in your action. There's never been anything like it. And thank goodness, because we've never been in this deep of trouble before either. You know, there, <laughs> there have been dangerous tyrants. You know, you, you think of Hitler and Mao and Stalin and, and uh, Mussolini and it goes on and on but there was always someone to come to the rescue from outside you could flee the country or or someone from outside would come in and ultimately defeat the bad guys well with the current thing that's going on with the great reset the new world order whatever you want to call it I call it the global domination agenda just because I've been calling it that for 20 years um, its goal is to control absolutely everyone get rid of nation boundaries get rid of rid of individual sovereignty so that everyone is a slave to the state and the state is run by a very few psychopathic tyrants. And they're very, very close. As I mentioned before, they control almost every sector already. But <laughs> uh, they, the cat's out of the bag. They're getting exposed. People are waking up. The best and the brightest now of the world are actually seeing these guys are dangerous. They're lying. They're coercing. They're killing. They're sickening people. Uh, so they're getting exposed and that whole house of cards is starting to come down. And that's why they're so desperate now. That's why they're trying to fool you and, and mandate you into putting toxic substances inside your body and tracking devices and all this kind of stuff. It's why they're trying to take over all of currency. It's why they're trying to take over education and the, the media and everything, because they've got to either fool or coerce everybody into going along with this giant technocratic communist plot and, until it's too late. So everybody wakes up and realizes, oh my God, I thought they were trying to save us from a pandemic. I thought they were trying to stabilize the currency. I thought they were trying to provide inexpensive education. No, that was all a ruse in order to make you a slave, financially, physically, emotionally, spiritually, everything. And so what I'm so encouraged about now is that the what they're doing to try to dominate everyone is to literally destroy the wholeness of every system. So destroy honest money, destroy freedom of, of uh, health choice, freedom of school choice, destroy relationships, just, you know, destroy the family. And the list goes on in every sector and we've laid it out. Uh, and so the antidote to that is revealing that under that big lie, is a seed truth. And I would say the core seed truth is that we're all born to thrive and the entire universe wants to support natural whole systems. So, so the antidote for human activism is recognize the destruction of a whole system 
and then work toward restoring the wholeness of a natural system, whether it's a permaculture farm or a, an honest cryptocurrency uh, or a school where that really honors the curiosity of, of children or a holistic you know, health program that's all voluntary and so forth. So in every sector, the answer is go ahead and create the whole system's alternatives that are aligned with the movement of the unified field. And then when the other systems comes crumbling down, instead of surrendering ourselves, subjugating ourselves to the next authoritarian regime, which is now global in scope, instead what we do is we obsolete them. We have truth and reconciliation and retribution from them, recompensation. But then meanwhile, all the people who are building the honest currencies and the great schools and the healthy food and the healthy um, medical care systems and so forth, that will simply be free to emerge and mm. literally create a decentralized whole system, voluntary civilization. And that is the key to thriving as far as I can tell. Yeah. I'm, I'm imagining like when, when the, the darkest moment, you know, the darkest before the dawn moment and everyone looks around like, Oh, what are we going to do? And then they, then they see like a beautiful life raft and they're like, ah, I can jump over there. And it's, it's already been created by the pioneers and, you know, that have met people like through, through your portal and, and other ways. Yeah. Um, I see it. I see it's possible. Hmm. Yeah. No. And you've had a bunch of these people on your show. I mean, you and I have such a privilege to be able to to engage in the most interesting, useful conversations we can find and then share it with people. This is unprecedented. You know, uh, even a hundred years ago, you, you couldn't come anywhere close to this. And even once we got TV and radio, it was totally controlled. Now we've got this fabulous sort of chaos of freedom that we're trying to, to not only maintain, but to really rescue and to nurture until it's actually just the entire culture we live in. Hmm. Yeah, I do. I do see, you know, I think some people, they get caught up in despair and uh, the next thing causes them anxiety. Um, and, and yet I feel from you, like such enthusiasm and excitement about uh, what's possible. People are constantly shocked um, because anybody who's followed our work at all knows that I know a lot. So it's not optimism. I'm not just choosing to put on rose-colored glasses and see that, see that it has, as the glass is half full. I, I know what serious danger we're in. And yet at the same time, I've gone so deep down the rabbit hole for so long that I really have a deep understanding of what's going on in the world. And that means understanding of what the bad guys are doing, but it's also a deep understanding of how the universe works. And the universe, the entire unified field, which is basically reality itself, it's the life force itself wants to build whole systems. It wants people to thrive. And the only thing that gets in the way of that is distorted human intent that is usually comes from past abuse. And, it, and its only real tools are coercion and deception. So, yeah, they're very wealthy people, but then most of the, of the bad guys got their wealth through the fraudulent Federal Reserve, which which fooled people into giving them permission to make up money anytime they wanted. Of course, they're going to take over the monopoly game if they can make up money. Not only can't we make up money, but they're taking the money we've got. <laughs> so, so, of course, they, they, they get some temporary power. But then you look at what they're doing with censorship of the media now. And it's not just around, you know actual early treatment for COVID or actual truths about the virus and the, the testing and the mass and all that stuff. Why would they have to censor all that stuff if they were really scientists or if they were really politicians who had our best interests in mind? So they're just showing blatantly that they have an agenda based, that has to be based on deception and coercion. And that's never a good thing. <laughs> I, I encountered from Aaron Apke, who I had on the show uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he was explaining the difference of power versus force. And yes. the, the negative polarity has to use force, which is like the, the coercion, the manipulation, <clears throat> you know, forcing people to do things and power. So love is an attractive power. It's like you want to flock towards this thing. 
because you feel the power of it and it pulls you towards it. And it's like of your own will. And it's much more powerful than the, than the force side of things. Absolutely. I've heard Aaron talk about that. He speaks very beautifully of it. And let me just add one wrinkle to that, which is another passion of mine was um, for 15 years, I uh, trained and taught the nonviolent martial art of Aikido. Hmm. And a, a lot of the other martial arts, which, I, which I, I had trained some in other arts, but I never really liked them. I couldn't com- commit my spirit 100% to uh, smashing somebody's face in or breaking their arm. Um, and so I kept looking and then I finally found Aikido. And Aikido is a philosophy of non-aggression with a physical expression uh, that actually neutralizes or disengages from an attack rather than having to to destroy the attacker. And that really helped me because uh, the other martial arts were based on force. Whereas um, Aikido is based on power. You literally are accessing the power of the, of the universe. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. They're, you know, women five feet tall, you know, weighing in at 95 pounds who can be throwing three big guys around all at the same time, not because they're faster or stronger, but because they're going with the flow instead of against it. And then leading both the body and the mind uh, into the resolution that that they're seeking. And that was uh, my, a lot of my training for looking at, okay, now how can we deal with uh, corrupt military people, intelligence people, corrupt bankers who are cheating and, uh, you know, assassins who are killing people to get their way? How can we deal with that agenda in as nonviolent ways as possible. How can mm-hmm. we win it as Alex Jones says, as an info war so that we don't have to go kinetic and, and just be, you know, be back humans fighting humans again. And that, and it's, it's never been more possible because of the media that we've got, because of the alternative currencies that we've got, because of the, the knowledge that we've got about how to grow food and so forth. We can genuinely expose and obsolete the crooked souls <laughs> the people who have lost touch with their souls and actually be replacing it all over the world with whole natural systems. And that's what's happening. I don't think it's stoppable. I I think it could be really messy in the meantime. A lot of people could get injured and killed. A lot of people already are, but compared to the Holocaust that that we will be under, if we, if we don't, uh, if we don't win this, uh, it doesn't hold a candle to that. So it's, I, I think the timing is critical for people to stand up right now to the degree to which they're, they're aware. And then check out our Solutions Hub because you can magnify your numbers in ways that have never happened on planet Earth. And I like to say that, you know, in terms of activism, if somebody pisses off a bumblebee, you know, that bumblebee can, can inflict a little bit of pain, you know, and you're going to try to avoid it. Uh, but if if you piss off an entire swarm of thousands of bees, then you're going to change your behavior real fast. And so this is what we're doing. There's just millions of great truth seekers and freedom lovers all over the world right now through the Solutions Hub and other networking tools that many of my friends are using, uh, including Jason Shurka, who is a good friend. I know you had Mm. him on your show and this unified platform that he's coming out with. And then there's Derek Bros and, and... John Bush have their Freedom Cells Network. It's it's literally happening all over the world. So we're just wanting to offer the solutions hub in there to help connect that network of networks. And anybody can become a part of that as long as you're not initiating force or fraud against anyone else. That reminds me, I think you've mentioned in a couple of interviews I've heard you do about just, just pause there because my internet was unstable. Um, I think I've heard you talk about a fundamental principle of non-aggression being uh, a way to to apply to, you know, governance or you know, getting a lot done. Could you talk a little bit about that? About the non-aggression principle? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Thanks for asking because I. Uh, this is the most important thing that I think that humanity is missing at our core is um, what the philosophers call a universal morality. You know, it used to be a long time ago that 
It's just, you know, whatever caveman had the biggest club and the, the most big friends would set the rules. And then the church came along uh, and actually developed a set of ethics. It's at the core of any great religion is a set of ethics, whether they're right or not, that it's, le it's at least an attempt. Um, and however, they didn't agree, the church, big churches, they didn't agree with each other or even amongst themselves. And so they fought the crusades and everything, and then were responsible for more deaths uh, than any entity in history. Uh, so then the, then the state came along, the whole idea of the nation state uh, and the rule of law. So it didn't have to be based on God's word. Human beings could get together and create ethical laws, and then people would be bound by, by the rule of law. However, you know, there's almost always corrupt people leading those states, and then the states want power over each other. And so then they started fighting, and then they were responsible for even more deaths than the church. It was the most murderous entity in history as the nation state, responsible for over 200 million murders in the 20th century alone, not counting wars. So that's just in, within your borders. The, the governments are murdering over 200 million people in a century. So rule of law, great idea, but not we haven't taken it to, to where it needs to go yet. And that's where the non-aggression principle comes in. Because I, what I think we've been missing is a universal morality based on uh, logic, based on science, based on coherent philosophy. And the non-aggression principle matches all of that. The non-aggression principle simply says that no one is allowed to initiate force or fraud against anyone else except in true self-defense. In other words, you have the right to protect yourself, but you can't start a fight. And it sounds so simple that everybody goes, well, yeah, of course. Um, but then they turn right around and over 95% of the people on the planet vote for some political leader who is then going to take your money against your will to run a government, uh, which is going to control other people, and then send your children off to wars against, you know, we've seen every single government in history has been corrupt. And it's not coincidence because they all depend on taxation. Taxation is actually theft. So every government is corrupt right at its core. And it's no wonder that then it manifests as, as corrupt out in the world. So what's the alternative to that? The, the, the universal application of the non-aggression principle is not communism, fascism, socially, or even democracy, which is just, you know, majority vote at its best. Uh, the, the only coherent form of association is voluntary association. That means basically anybody can do whatever they want as long as they're not violating someone else or violating an ecosystem. And we're all kind of trained to think, oh, that's going to be chaos and blood in the streets. No, you're not allowed to create blood in the streets. You'll get in trouble for that. You're not allowed to pollute the air. You're not allowed to pollute the water. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to cheat and steal and all, all that kind of stuff. So there would be ethics. There would be uh, courts in the sense that they're dispute resolution organizations. There are insurance companies. There are security companies. So all the functions that we're looking for from government would be there, but they wouldn't be from a few people who have a monopoly on force. That's the problem. So what it would be is there would be a free market of private security organizations. Everybody thinks, oh, that's Blackwater. Now we're just going to be the rich guys are going to be starting wars with their private armies. No, you can't do that. As soon as, you, as soon as you start doing any kind of violation with your security uh, team, then you would be immediately personally and professionally liable. You wouldn't have any customers. You wouldn't have any insurance. You would be incarcerated if you were actually initiating violence. So it's simply not going to work. So the key is you'll have all these institutions. You'll still have businesses. You'll still have clubs and associations and uh, all that will happen. But it will all be decentralized. It'll all be voluntary. And uh, everybody as an individual will, will be held accountable to the non-aggression principle. And then the last thing I want to say in my quick overview of this is that you know, I, I tried to make a good case logically and coherently for, yes, this would make sense. Now, the great news is that everywhere that Kimberly and I have traveled in the world, we talk about this all the time. We have, ask everybody, uh, 
what do you think of the non-aggression principle? Do you, do you want to be violated against your will? And we haven't <laughs> found a single person who wants to be violated against their will. Now, yes, we have run across a few, you know, who want to be spanked and whipped and so forth, but not against their will. You know, they, they, and if two people agree to do that consensually, that's a whole different thing. That's not initiating violence uh, against somebody involuntarily. So look what we've got. We've got not only a philosophically and, and, and uh, logically coherent ethic, but it turns out that everybody agrees to it already. You know, it's, it's challenging to get, you know, your business to decide on a, on a logo, to get your family to decide on where to go to dinner. Imagine how challenging it is to get the entire humanity 7.6 billion people all to agree on one ethic and they already do that's wow. where this that's where the science and the philosophy come together in the morality now i have to admit i have met a few people who say okay yeah i, I don't want to be violated against my will but i do believe i should be able to violate other people uh in order to rule them because i'm richer i'm whiter i'm more educated i'm smarter i'm more clever i am darker right whatever it is all these tyrants have some justification you know it's either an, an ethnicity or or a a class or a nation state some excuse why they should be able to go out and start a war or take people's stuff and but none of it holds up to the non-aggression principle so our big challenge now to survive and thrive without massive global violence is to have a critical mass of people understand this simple principle, because when they do, we don't have to have, you know, everybody on, on earth be enlightened in order to live harmoniously. We need enough people enlightened in the sense of a universal morality to actually create our systems of law based on one simple rule, the non-aggression principle. Everything else comes out of that. And we're not there yet. Martin Luther King said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We've been we've been moving toward national sovereignty, local sovereignty, and now individual sovereignty for a long time. The birth of America was a great step, but we're not there. We still had the seeds of the you know the cancer of authority built in to our constitution. And the bill, of, I mean the, the Declaration of Independence was a really strong start. It was almost there, but then it's been bastardized and destroyed ever, ever since. So I think we're very, we understand now what needs. I believe enough of us are starting to understand what we need. Now it's a question of how do we use this incredible global media system to simply awaken people to what they would already agree to if they understood it? That was a really long-winded answer, but that was, that was a amazing. Question. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering um, where people inadvertently slip into aggression like uh maybe you decide you don't want to be aggressive you you want to abide by non-aggression and yet through our mm, domestication of society like we we're just like accidentally aggressive like where where are the um areas you think that people would need to bring the most awareness to well i, I the the biggest one is government itself because government is the the source of virtually every problem that we're facing <clears throat> but most people think that those problems are somehow going to be solved by government <laughs> with the the first rule of government is always put in into place laws that will keep you in power <laughs> so that's that's not going to work we say in thrive too that the only way we're going to get out of this is uh based on principles not politics so, so the governance is the big one. And instead of a government court, you'd have a, what's called a DRO, a dispute resolution organization. So you'd have very skilled mediators and arbitrators and so forth who would work hand in hands with the security organization. If, if somebody, you know, is caught robbing your house, um, then, you know, hopefully you don't have to shoot them. You can call your security organization. They come and, uh, and, you know, and incarcerate them till they're no longer a danger. But then you have a dispute resolution. You actually resolve the conflict. You find out, okay, who's, who started the, the violation and what would be the appropriate uh, rebalancing 
of that violation. So if somebody comes into your house and steals $300, well, um, they broke a window. They're going to have to repair the, the window. They owe you the $300, but they also added a lot of stress and risk to your life. So they would owe you some damages on top of that. And the person wouldn't necessarily, hopefully, need to go to jail for for relatively minor or victimless infractions. Um, but they could actually, they would have a repayment schedule where whether they were in jail working there or whether they were working on the outside, they would need to uh, to provide enough money, as much as they could afford, back to their victim until the victim was completely made whole. And then that's actually resolved after that. Now, this person has a record that, okay, they they violated one time. So the next time that they violate, uh, you, you know, they, the, the dispute resolution organization may not be a, as lenient. And of course, if somebody's out, you know, if there's some psychopaths out murdering or raping or something like that, um, then you'd have to have places to incar incarcerate them. But even when they're incarcerated, their work time is spent not making license plates for a company or doing work for the government. They're, they're, they're contributing in, to the manufacture of products and the revenue that they, the wages that they get go back to make their, making their victim whole until they are. Okay, I see that um, you're talking about some of the, the practical application steps. I, I guess what I'm asking about is, is like, where might we be unaware personally of, uh, you know, the, so, so obviously like stealing from someone, it's, it's pretty clear or initiating right. conflict. Um, <clears throat> But in a in a day to day setting, like someone that just runs a business or or, or whatever, like are there unexpected ways that the people are violating the the non aggression principle? Well, the the grayest area I believe for emerging dispute resolution organizations uh, will be in terms of um, environmental encroachment, because uh, if I'm if I live up river for you and I'm you know, dumping my wastewater in there because I've never thought about it. You know, I, it, I thought I was just throwing it away, <laughs> but it actually it came down into your intake pipe and, and you end up drinking and getting sick or something like that. You know, I, obviously that uh, I, I'm, I wasn't intending to hurt you, but I did. Um, and so there's a lesson for me to be learned. I need to make it, I need to stop doing that act to infect anyone. And then I need to make it right for you. Another one is just in terms of, uh, air pollution. Uh, you know, we're all, any one of, one of us who's driving uh, a, a fossil fuel car, we are, um, we are polluting. And we, to some degree, we have to still. Pretty soon we'll be on uh, non-polluting cars. But while we are, then we need to make sense of, okay, well, how much is each person allowed to do that before it's actually damaging other people's lungs? Um, and, you know, factories, how much can factories put out before it's polluting everybody who's uh, breathing that air. And uh, if somebody is playing their stereo really loud in their house, you know, they're not damaging anyone physically, but you are violating their, their space. It's noise pollution. So that, you know, you need to come up with some ways to make all of that, you know, they make it so you can play your stereo, but you're not disrupting the lives of uh, of all your neighbors all of that will come out uh of precedent you know as disputes get resolved then you get effective precedents and the next time you don't necessarily have to go through all the rigmarole and it's like oh yeah that was already decided you know five years ago in that particular case let's see how we can adapt that decision to this same similar one okay yeah yeah and, and the a slightly different, um, you know, like, okay, we're polluting and maybe we wouldn't pollute if we felt connected with the environment. Like if we felt it's like this, the separation idea, like we are not part of our environment. Therefore, like if I put trash into the environment or pollute the environment, it's not me or it's not my system. It's just like going there or somewhere else, which is separate than me. Um, that's a little bit different than what you're talking about, but, um, it's similar in the sense that like, how, how would you know when you're disrupting a whole system? You know, like you have to be in tune enough 
to know that you are causing damage. Um, and you know, the stay, you know, being inside so much with air, air conditioning and TV and the internet and stuff makes it so that we're not in tune enough to even really see our aggression in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, it's a great point. I, I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, because if we were all enlightened beings on planet earth, think how much better we would be treating each other because when you really know that you're this other person are you really going to steal from them are you really going to you know, insult or abuse or rape or, oh, and then, if we're enlightened beings the behavior is very different on the planet <clears throat> and we're not so we need to get the most enlightened rules as possible and and then prevention and and consequences so it's the same way here where um if you're none of us can survive without exploiting our environment you know we, sooner or later you've got to cut a vegetable or, or hire someone else to cut it in order to eat it in order you know unless you're a successful breatharian we're all exploiting uh the food of the world we're all breathing the the oxygen uh we're all using minerals we're all using wood um uh, a lot of people still choose to to eat animals and um, you know, I've got a friend who's a, the, the chief of a Native American tribe up in Alaska. <clears throat> and when I was speaking with him about this, I, I was a vegetarian. Uh, and he said, well, you know, I really respect your being a vegetarian. And I'm glad that you can afford to be a vegetarian, given that you live in California. He said, where I live, you die as a vegetarian. And he said, we've been living in harmony with the caribou, the seals and the fish for thousands of years. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, we, we've just learned the principles of you don't take too many caribou in a season. You don't take uh, pregnant uh, females. You know, you, if possible, you, you get the, the wounded um, or if the sick, if it's not going to be uh, dangerous. So they're, when, they, when they need to kill to eat, they're doing it with tremendous respect and knowledge of the wholeness of the caribou herd. And they're doing the same thing with the seals and the same thing in the fisheries. So that's the kind of intelligence that we will be building. There's a woman named Eleanor Ostrom who won the Nobel Prize for a book called uh, Managing the Commons. And she did some research on a fishery up in the Northeast. And, um, and she did a number of replications. But her first one was in this fishery because the, the, the fish were going away because they were overfishing it. So um, you know, the government tried to regulate it and they, and they, they couldn't succeed. The corporations, uh, you know, were, they, they were just trying to, to get as many fish out as they could. So that didn't work. What she found was <clears throat> a regular ongoing organization of everyone who has a vested interest in the, in the health of that fishery uh, has representatives in ongoing regular communication, setting the parameters season to season for that fishing and once they got to that the whole thing has worked ever since that's what we need to do for human beings with every ecosystem mm, wow uh, thanks for that yeah i'll have to check out that book that sounds like a great i'm, I'm always looking for models you know that yes. can be acquired, applied across uh cross discipline like that <clears throat> um i, well, I like know you had uh, joel salatin on once he's a great yeah uh, source of wisdom in this field, uh, you know, Jim Gale uh, is another one. There's great permaculture folks out there. Um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of the the mycelium guy, the mushroom guy, with that beautiful movie on the mushrooms, oh, yes. the magic of the mushrooms. Uh, he, he's got just got tremendous wisdom that the rest of us can learn from about, uh, you know, obviously he's not against eating mushrooms, but he's very aware of us, us, human beings being a, a part of maintaining regenerative ecologies. Yeah, Stamets. I think you're probably referring to Paul Stamets. Paul Stamets, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a I had a couple sort of random random questions. Maybe I could just throw your way. Uh, sure, a, a lightning round. <laughs> yeah. What is? I'll try the, to be quicker in my answers. What is the ancient dragon alliance? You you cut out again. What is the what? What is the the Dragon Alliance? You cut. You keep cutting out after what is the <laughs> <laughs> next question, please. No. Um, <laughs> right. 
what is obviously the, somebody doesn't want me to hear this i know what is the dragon alliance oh the dragon alliance. oh yeah this is a short question <laughs> Uh, the, the short answer is that it's a centuries old league of royal families in uh, particularly five countries in Asia, Japan, China, Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And they are the wealthiest people in the world by far, way beyond the Gateses and Musks and Rockefellers and Rothschild. They've been collecting gold for thousands of years. Um, and they have it well hidden. <clears throat> They're still mining secretly, many of them, particularly in China. Uh, <clears throat> and so they have actually been the most influential people in, on the planet financially without most people ever having heard of them. They don't publicize themselves. They don't have meetings, public meetings that anybody knows about. You don't have pictures of them. Uh, I, I've met with them in four different countries. Um, but it was always clandestine meetings uh, that, you know, I was not, I, I don't speak, I don't reveal photographs of them or anything. Um, but it was very encouraging to meet them and realize that they are super wealthy and they have a spiritual covenant, all of them, to use at least 80% of their wealth to, um, to nurture the health of the planet uh, and everyone on it. And they are actively involved in doing that with various rainforests and so forth. They're trying to release trillions in what they call humanitarian funds. And they've tried at least three times to release these funds and the global banking cabal, the, the, the whole Federal Reserve, Rothschild, Rockefeller cartel uh, has managed so far to stop them from releasing those funds because they... They want, want to continue, the bankers want to continue controlling the world through the fiat money system. And this completely gets rid of that. It goes back to, well, it's actually what Putin announced two days ago. <laughs> He's going back to, to uh, gold-based currencies. Mm. He's not taking fiat money anymore for, for his oil. So this is a, literally, this in the last few days, this is an absolute turning point over, from the, la the last century. is about to turn around in a really healthy way. So that's the dragon family. And I've said in terms of turning around the whole global uh, domination agenda, we need three main things. We need truth media. Uh, and that's happening like crazy. Uh, truth media is already the mainstream media. Joe Rogan's show is like five times the, in each episode, the, the, the mainstream yeah. uh, audience on CNN during prime time. And that, you know, there's other people like Alex Jones and, you know, Tucker Carlson's, I think, in third place or something like that. Um, Dell Bigtree. These are huge audiences that are growing uh, all, all completely independently and not because they have great advertisement. It's because they're getting to the truth and human beings want the truth. They don't want pharmaceutical ads. They don't want political propaganda. They want the truth so they can actually solve problems uh, and thrive. So that's the first thing we need is truth media. And we're getting it. The second thing we need is. Uh, is money, a lot of money, because the Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum, when they announced the Great Reset, they literally went around the, the table in the room to raise funds for the Great Reset and raise 700 billion in an hour. So we're, you know, we're up against that, but it's all, you know, it's, it's, it's fake money. So they can only win in the fake system. So the, so the Dragon family is on our side. They are against the New World Order. And they want a multipolar, honest money, the whole deal. So that's number two. It's already in place. It's just a matter of, of getting the creeps out of the way. And then the final thing uh, is that we need force. You know, we're up against a lot of militaries, a lot of uh, agencies, uh, a lot of private assassin networks and so forth. The good news is that what they call the White Hats, which is a, a, a sort of an informal league of the good guys in the military uh, divisions and in the intelligence agencies and to some extent in the government. And it's, uh, it's especially in the US, but it's also in a lot of the other Western countries as well. They are actually quite well organized. Uh, there are a lot of who was behind the QAnon phenomenon. You know, QAnon went some strange directions that particularly when it was infiltrated and propaganda came out and so forth. But at the base, 
of, of what QAnon was saying is absolutely true. It's touching on this whole Asian Dragon Alliance thing. And so they're, if they try to suppress America, the, their main goal of the bad guys is to collapse America because we are the major hurdle. We're, there's a lot of liberty lovers and we're well armed. So that's a real danger. <laughs> that, so we, we literally are the hope for the world right now. You're watching what's happening as Australia is going down, Canada, New Zealand. They're all going down because they, they've all had their guns taken away by the queen. You know, they're all Commonwealth nations and they're not allowed to have guns. and They're not allowed to protest. So um, so America really is the last bastion of hope right now for getting the protection that we need to have honest media, to have honest currency. And they have enough force because the, the American military branches, I do not believe will go to war against American citizens for the global domination cabal. Mm. So that's, the, that's great news to me. I didn't even know that when we finished Thrive One. I was praying for all three of those things, but I didn't think they would happen anytime soon. They're all there already. Wow, yeah, fantastic. Um, do these people like the Dragon Alliance? Do they find you just because you made Thrive? Is you know, like, yeah. how do you come to meet such you know the inventors we've talked about? These powerful families, like you have access to some incredible people. Um, how, how is that? When Kimberly and I put out Thrive One, we joked like days before the the premiere. We joked is like. Okay, we have no idea whether anybody's ready for this movie or not. I was envisioning maybe we'll have to put it, you know, buried in a time capsule. Maybe we'll have to just send it out on a rocket ship or just broadcast it out for some other planet who might have a similar predicament. Maybe the information <laughs> would be useful. And we launched the thing and it just went completely viral. And it continues to be viewed by hundreds of thousands of people every month, 10 years later. And it's, it's, it went on to become the most widely seen documentary, feature documentary in history. We've got over 94 million documented views. And so to Kimberly and me, this was tremendously encouraging that human beings could confront very emotionally challenging information, you know, the truth about these institutions, which they had been trusting and the real agenda. But also, as we talked to people, when we traveled around, people were thrilled to find out what was going on because then they could get some traction on solutions that would be commensurate to the problem. So we, we ended up kind of inadvertently creating what Kimberly called uh, a trust building calling card, uh, was what the film became. So we were contacted, I mean, we, we would have a, a thousand communications a day for years after the film came out. We had multiple readers filtering them through and so forth. And then we started getting in 2012, it came out in 2011, we started getting contacts from different dragon families. And they didn't even know that the other ones were contacting us. We were contacted by 13 different groups from all five countries. No, from four countries. We, we, weren't, we weren't contacted from Vietnam, but all four other countries were contacting us. So we started kind of finding out who they were and uh, they would do various things to verify for us who they were. Uh, you know, I think we had some real scammers, true, too, who were just trying to become brokers for the money and, you know, get me to put a certain amount of money in the bank because that would allow them to release these, <laughs> these bonds and so forth. It's like, no, I'm not, not going there. But then I ended up um, traveling to three of the countries and then being in encrypted communication with the fourth. Um, and I really saw how real they were. I've studied them intensely for 10 years now. And there, there's huge documentary evidence of their existence, of their wealth, and of their intention. And so I, you know, like when we went to visit one of the dragon families in China, I spent three weeks with them. Okay. So, you, you know, you really get to know someone in, in over three weeks. And I grilled them. I was ready to be sent home at any time. I said, listen, you know, sounds like you're so humanitarian, but how do you reconcile that with the, uh, with the, uh, individual rights abuses in China? And they said, good question. You know, glad you asked. That's the Chinese Communist Party. We're in the process of, of getting rid of the people who are doing that. But it takes a long time. To, it's like a, a, an ocean liner. It, once you decide you're going north, you decide to go east, it still takes a long time to turn that thing. So they said, look back to 
uh, to when we got rid of Mao and look where we've been going ethically ever since Mao. And I look back and say, oh, you're right. You know, you have actually been going in a good direction. You're not there yet, but neither are we in the United States for sure. And then they, I said, well, they wanted us, when they wanted us to come to China, I, I said, I'd like to do that. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of time and it's a lot of money to come over there. And how do we know you're even real? Again, they said, well, they, you're asking the right question. There's no reason you should, that you should believe us. And we, we're not going to expect you to just trust us. So short of meeting, we're going to tell you some of the things that we're doing in the world before they happen. Mm. And then you, then you see whether or not they happen. I said, well, that, that sounds smart. So what's the first one? They said, well, we're about to abolish the Federal Reserve. And I go, blah, 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 blah. wait, wait a minute. Could you run that by me again? <laughs> and uh, so they, they said, you just watch. And literally two weeks later, uh, Ben Bernanke, who was then the chairman of the Fed, got up and made this speech. Then they weren't closing down the building. They weren't closing down the organization, but they were closing the ability to print money out of nothing. And so I got back on an encrypted line with uh, one of the heads of the, this particular dragon family. And I, I said, is that what you meant? And he said, yeah, we just shut off because they said, you were right in your movie that they just print money, but they've actually been borrowing that money against our gold since 1913, when they brought in the Fed and the IRS. Mm -hmm. they, they said the IMF, the World Bank, they've all been borrowing from us in addition to most countries in the world, have been borrowing from our gold for almost 100 years. So that was a real, and I could go on with the stories that just kept verifying all of that, but I know this was supposed to be a short answer. <laughs> well, is that, is that even, uh, because they've, they've been still printing lots of money. Oh, so yeah. yeah. So, so they shut it down for about four years. And the, so the, 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 the American bankers were going through Belgium, they were going through the, the, um, the EU, they were going through Japan, uh, through kind of proxy printing, but they weren't actually allowed to print uh, our money. But now they have, uh, they've opened it up again. So we're, you know, back in real trouble. And I don't, I, I don't know how the, how the Dragon family is, is doing that. When they shut them down originally, I said, well, you know, how did the bankers take that? And they said, well, of course they were pissed, but they've got no choice. Um, and so th what they did was they asked the Dragon family if they could go to, to the world court and declare bankruptcy. <laughs> and the Dragon elders said, no, you know, we loaned you this money so that you could save the environment and stabilize economies worldwide. And you've done exactly the opposite of both of those things. So, no, you're done. We're not going to let you declare bankruptcy and put all of your debts on the back of the American people in addition to the, to the taxes. So, so they, they are good guys. They are on our, our side and it's going to be really important. Cool. Uh, yeah. I, I love knowing we have powerful friends. Uh, it's like, exactly. Uh, it's like, uh, I, I learned at some point that there's, there's like, uh, you know, monks whose whole job is their, their bodies in almost stasis. And they're just like using all their force of will to like, be in a cave and project peace to the world and i was like oh that's such a such a comforting <laughs> thought that knowing someone's just doing that job for us well, well now that you brought that up um they this one particular dragon family wanted me to become their kind of representative for all of north america in dis in distributing these these humanitarian funds um and so they started educating me like behind the scenes they started really telling me so phenomenal detail as mm. to what's going on in the world they're the most informed people i've ever met by far but they also started training me in their spiritual tradition and i won't go into a, a lot of it this philosophically it's basically this this chang dynasty confucian philosophy but in terms of their structure i met with the number two and three guy um but the number one guy i, I said can i meet the number one they said, no, nobody meets number one. They said only people who are officially involved, they only see him once a year because he mm -hmm. lives up in the, this high valley in China where these, there are these supposedly very potent healing waters. And he spends almost all of his life in meditation. And he's doing exactly what you were saying. He's basically radiating uh, peace and wisdom to all of humanity, but especially to you know, uh, their whole league. And um, so he is their direct link with God. 
So he's the most spiritually advanced. And so they work with him. They make all of the decisions except the most important ones where there are huge decisions, world changing decisions to make. Then they go up and visit him <laughs> and, and he makes that decision and they bring it back down. And he comes down once a year and does ceremony with the followers of that particular uh, group. And then he goes back for the next year. He's up in retreat. Wow. Wow. That's, um, I've, I feel like I had a little little moment of telepathy picking picking that up. Uh, exactly, I'm glad you did. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, this seems like perhaps a good place to end. Although, uh, I'd love to invite you back sometime because this was amazing. Um, well, it's really a pleasure talking with with you. I, I look forward to that as well. Any anything you want to leave people with, or, or promote, or point people towards? <clears throat> well. I guess I would say just in terms of a, a fundamental statement, we make the statement in Thrive 1 and then again in Thrive 2 that from, from my lifetime of research into that, one of the main things that I want to get across is we already have what it takes to thrive. We've got it in terms of resources. We've got it in terms of wisdom. We've got it in terms of technology. We already have it. It's a matter of, of obsoleting authority and then collaborating effectively. And, uh, and along the lines of the latter one, collaborating effectively, if, for any of you who don't know our work, I recommend that you go to thriveon.com, uh, watch the first movie, watch the second movie, uh, check out, there's lots of videos um, and articles on the, on the website. And then if you're interested in going deeper in the conversation, join us on the Freedom Portal. It's a fantastic community, and we really go deep on these topics. And then um, if you get to the point where you feel like you have a sufficient understanding of what's wrong in the world, you know, the risks that we are under, and you want to do something about it and be really effective, then go to the Freedom Portal section. Uh, I mean, sorry, go to the Solutions Hub section and start. We've got a landing page there that takes you through a process of learning to identify your purpose, what sector you want to work on, what issue within that sector, what level of engagement, meaning uh, immediate needs uh, or systemic change or consciousness shift. Once you know that about yourself, which very few people do, then you're a very powerful force in the world. Then you can, on the Solutions Hub, you can start a group, you can join a group, you can connect with your group with other groups. And this, as I said earlier in this conversation, this, I believe, from a practical point of view, is the main tool that's missing. Philosophically, the non-aggression principle is the understanding that we need. But in terms of practical tools, this solutions hub is, in my understanding, the most important tool that we're missing. And now it's here. Fantastic. And I, I just want to thank you and acknowledge you for all this work, you know, these documentaries, putting this solutions hub together. And I know from my own sort of trying to process massive amounts of information through the years. Like I can see how you have just like studied so deeply in so many areas and you're like able to communicate it. Um, so I just want to say, you know, I, I see that part of you as well and, and I appreciate it. Thank you. I really appreciate that too. Yeah. I think it's what I came for this lifetime. Um, my particular knack is for connecting the dots in the big picture. And then I made an agreement with the universe about, 30 years ago, if it would feed me what was needed, I would do my best to cohere it and to disperse it. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to do it through Truth Media Outlet like yours. So thanks a lot for what you're doing. Wow. Uh, that's cool to hear. Thank, yeah. Thanks for coming on the show. My pleasure. See you all later. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to the whole episode. You made it all the way to the end. Congratulations. And I'm going to invite you again, remind you again to join us for the no-cost quantum entrepreneurship training, April 19th, 20 and 21st. Again, this is a training that I put together, a high-level business training for coaches, healers, and spiritual entrepreneurs. You can sign up at DerekLoudermilk.com or find them in the show notes. And it's a free training. We're doing it live in person. So you're going to want to be there. 
on each of the days. You'll have a chance to ask personal questions, maybe even get some coaching on your specific business. This is something that I would probably normally charge $1,000 for or more to attend the event, but I'm doing it for free as a service to my audience, to my listeners, and to help spiritual entrepreneurs. So save the dates, mark your calendars, and hope to see you there.